Yeah, no, it's this guy named Chris Sparks. No, no, he opened up. No, no, before even before I even started streaming, he he hit us with a five hundred dollar donation. Yeah, he said something about he knows my true nature, and you know what that means. It means we cannot allow him to speak to anyone any further. You have this location. Strike. Oh, uh, hello. <laughs> and that was nothing. Oh, sorry, I love you, bye. Hello and welcome to Office Hours, a live component of the facility where good old Professor Kyle opens up his blast doors and gives you a fancy digital transition and lets you, the general public, and my wonderful staff, professors, associate, researchers, interns who get me coffee, and my security team, ask Professor Kyle any old question uh, that your heart desires, and we'll also be going through a number of topics, as we'll want to do, on this show. Uh, this week we'll be getting to a number of interesting topics, hopefully, in between all your comments, questions, and uh, questioning why I'm wearing such a casual shirt today. We'll be talking about the new particle physics news and whether or not we should get super excited about it. Spoiler, spoiler alert. Maybe. Uh, we'll also be talking about mosquitoes. We'll be talking about a new way to upscale footage into slow motion, even though the data isn't there, and how that relates to your brain, and how all of reality is a is a lie. Uh, we'll also be taking one of your comments, questions from the last episode at the facility, which was kind of a personal one. And finally, we'll be talking about Yuri Gagarin, Gagarin, if we get that far. But before. I get to all that, of course, you all in the Super Chats, um, if you really, really want to speak with me, you can try Super Chat on YouTube, I try my very best to get to everyone who leaves a Super Chat, um, but if I don't, please know that you're still simping for science, and you're paying for my fancy voice changers, we had Chris Sparks with a 500 to open the stream, we have Peanuts and Lart, Peanuts enlargement pills with a 19 says, no questions, I just wanted to sim for science. You see how easy that is? And it doesn't have to stop here. You can also continue this conversation with me every day on Discord and Patreon, where you're getting members-only live streams, behind-the-scenes photos, and all that stuff. If you go to patreon.com slash kylehill, as my security team is putting in the chat, yes, that's a security team in the chat. One is a castle made of beef, and another is a bucket with a wrench. Don't make them mad because they know how to use it. Snow Wolf with the $25 donation before we get to our first topic in particle physics. Hey show, Kyle the love. Did I do that right? I guess so. I know staring at the sun is bad, but how much of a risk is it mitigated by closed eyelids? Well, uh, your eyelids aren't completely opaque. Some sunlight comes through your eyelids. Obviously, that's why you have to close your eyes at night or close your eyes to make things uh, darker to you. Um, but because the luminance, the brilliance of the sun is so high, um, you still probably shouldn't stare at it. Don't stare at the sun, even if your eyes are closed. You know why I have to say that? Because I don't know the exact answer to your question, and I don't want to be responsible for any dum-dums going blind-blind. Travis Hoff with the five says, hey, how many Kevins are there inside of the facility? Hmm, trick question. How many facilities are inside of Kevins? Yeah, think about that. Joe Bassett with the 20 says, first live stream I've been to in a while. So glad to be here, Joe. I love that you're here. I have no personal connection to you, but I like that you're here. A uh, heavy weapons guy with the 10 says, show high, Kyle the love. As a physics fan, can't wait for you to get into muons and other funky particles up and down chaos. By the way, Sheila is loose in the fruit garden again can we get someone i know the collar is a hassle but just just put it you just throw meat in front of her and then you she animal control around here is quite dumb and let's go to lucy fox with the 20 says kyle your hair is wonderful is the hey thanks is the oxygen destroyer bomb from godzilla king of monsters possible and how bad would it be let's pause the super chats for a second so we can get on to our first topic i have no idea what the oxygen destroyer bomb in Godzilla King of Monsters is supposed to do. Um, and I have no idea how the Hollow Earth in the Godzilla verse is supposed to work. And that's it. I was going to say something about I used to work for Legendary Pictures. Uh, but why don't we just skip that? 
for this. <laughs> ah, long time lurker, first time. Super chatter says, "Jay, she be 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 Okay, you like that? My lips are fast. Particle physics. You may have heard about this big news in the land of physics that some weird particles are making some physicists consider whether or not there is a new fundamental force in the universe. Now, obviously, if there were a new fundamental force in the universe, that would be big, big, big news. Why? Because we have right now what's called the standard model of particle physics. This is a full theoretical description of more or less everything we've ever observed in the universe at the smallest scales. And within the standard model, within all these theories that encompass leptons, quarks, muons, electrons, neutrons, all that stuff. Within this model, there are predictions it makes, right? So any theory that you have, it says, well, if this X, Y were to happen, then it might produce Z. The standard model has been one of the most, if not the most successful scientific theory in human history. It produces the most accurate predictions of any model, and it has guided physics, theoretical physics, particle physics, for a hundred years. So, to have something that describes everything in the known universe to a pretty uh, accurate degree, to have that be missing some fundamental pillar of this Colosseum of science would be a big deal. Another reason why the standard model is so important is the scope of it, the the forces involved, the 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 uh, results it can produce from its theories really leave no other room in the universe for other stuff. Okay, by which I mean. There doesn't seem to be any room for any other fundamental forces. Using from exploring things on the quantum level to scaling all thing, uh, things up to particle accelerators, like we'll talk about in a second, like a Fermi Lab and the Large Hadron Collider, we have explored an energy range for the universe where it seems like there's nothing else. It seems like we're not missing anything. That's how successful this uh, standard model has been. You can extend that outwards, of course, to say, well, uh, for, for certain claims, for example, uh, you know, the human spirit is some sort of energy, floating energy, and maybe ghosts are that energy, and they're just in a different dimension, and they have a higher wavelength. Right? No. Right now, everything that you and I should be able to interact with on our medium scale in this universe. We're not very big, we're not very small, we're somewhere in the middle. Everything that you sh and I should be able to interact with is very well explained by the standard model. Which means if you have a ghost encounter, it's probably not evidence of a new fundamental force in the universe. You are probably just scared of something. Totally reasonable. So I say all that to say this, to have something come along and possibly shake the foundations of particle physics, the standard model, that's a big deal. So what was going on here? Well, physicists at Fermilab, just a couple of days ago, uh, on April 7th, they released results that confirmed early results from about 15 years ago. 15 years ago, physicists at the Brookhaven National Laboratory, they discovered that one of these particles, one of these fundamental particles, muons, which uh, physicists, physicists like to call fat electrons, they're like, <laughs> they're like electrons, but they be chonky. So these physicists at Brookhaven 15 years ago and now at Fermilab, found that the muon wasn't acting as it should. More specifically, that its magnetic moment, how it's affected by magnetism and what it does inside of electrical and magnetic fields, wasn't lining up with what the theory predicted. Now, that's a problem because, as I said, when a theory is that successful, if your experimental results do not fit within your theory, one of them is wrong. Uh, Richard Feynman 
the genius, uh, Richard Feynman, physicist, he used to say that if your theory doesn't fit with experimental results, your theory is wrong. But of course, you could also have done the experiment wrong, which we'll get to. So the wiggle of this muon, if you think about it, this is not accurate, of course, but if you think about it just like a ball and how it's spinning, how it was wiggling as it moved through fields, these giant, super powerful mag uh, electromagnetic fields inside of particle accelerators, very, very powerful magnetic fields, how it was being tracked, its movement was not fitting with theory. So, these two results taken together have led a number of news outlets, a number of my colleagues like Physics Girl and others to say, well, this might be a new fundamental force of the universe. This might change the standard model. This might, uh, this might be cray cray, as physicists often say, trust me. So there's two possibilities here, right? This experiment is correct and the results are correct and therefore the theory is missing something. And that's what would lead to possibly a new force or what have you. The second option is that the theory um, was missing something in the first place and that when you do it with a better resolution, when you understand the theory a little bit better, or you change the theory a little bit, it will produce the experimental results that you're looking for. So there's this gap in understanding. What is wrong? Is it the experimental result or is it the theory and how do we realize this? Well, I'm bringing up this tension because everyone is kind of breathlessly reporting that all of physics might change. But what are the chances that all physics, well, foundational physics, we totally missed something or we totally didn't predict something? What are the chances of that versus us as hairless apes living on a biofilm of a rock floating through nothingness, what are the chances that we're wrong about something? I'd say that's higher. And so, within days of the Fermilab publishing these results, um, some theoretical physicists, part of the Budapest Marseille Wupperall collaboration, a large-scale collab collaboration of physicists who have been trying to see if the older theory, the older prediction was incorrect. Um, for a while, they published recently in the journal Nature on the same day as these results. And they found something interesting. What they did was to see, uh, they wanted to see if this muon wiggling was truly not predicted by the standard model. So they went back to the standard model itself. Now, the standard model, a lot of it was founded and uh, calculated and established a long time ago, almost 100 years ago. Paul Dirac, uh, 1928, um, long time ago. And so what this team did, all the way fast forward into 2021, the darkest timeline, what they did is they went back to the predictions, the equations, the theories, or sorry, rather the equations and the theories, and they tried, they threw everything at them. They tried to update them. They tried to make sure they were as rigorous as possible. They did that by putting them through intensely powerful supercomputers, things that a uh, hundred years ago you could only dream of calculations you could only dream of that would just not be possible the computer would fill an entire warehouse kind of thing and so what they did is they took the weak the weak and strong nuclear forces electromagnetic forces and gravity forces and they plotted them in this calculatable space it was kind of a uh, as they say it, it was kind of like a weather system. Um, it was kind of like a, an atmospheric model. You, you take a model of the atmosphere, you, you have some sort of physical calculated space, then you throw in all the equations, how you think stuff works, and then you watch how that model evolves over time. How do things interact with each other? How do little particles wiggle, for example? So they went back with supercomputers they used millions of computer processing hours at multiple supercomputer centers in Europe all at the same time. And they threw all of these old equations into this 
calculatable space, and then they saw, or and then they tried to calculate, try to predict, remember, good theories predict ex good experimental results. They tried to predict what the muon would do once these supercomputers had a crack at how a physical system would evolve using the standard model. And lo and behold, what did this new team, publishing on the exact same day as these foundation-changing results, what did they find? Well, they found that using the new, updated idea of how the theories worked in the universe, they found that the muons wiggled exactly how the Fermi lab muons wiggled and exactly like the Brookhaven muons wiggled. This means with their update, with their reinterpretation of the old theories, they got the results that were supposed to break the theory. Now, I should say that like anything in science, this is open to further investigation. This is one study from one team, although it is a number of theoretical physicists working with multiple supercomputers across all of Europe. Mm -hmm. So this result can always be updated, changed, and challenged. However, like I was alluding to earlier, the chances that the particle model, uh, the standard model, is definitely missing something big, I think is much lower than, oh, we ran, we were finally able to run particle model equations through supercomputers that weren't available 100 years ago, and it predicted the results that you saw, which means the theory is still good. So, I would, I don't have the answer to whether or not this is, uh, none of us, no, no scientist has the answer to, as to whether or not the muon is truly wiggling weirdly. However, it would appear as though without breaking the standard model, you can still get the weird results that were observed, which means the standard model is not wrong. There isn't a new fundamental force in the universe. And physics is not broken. That could be the case, but in my view, we'd have to see some pretty strong evidence otherwise. As Carl Sagan would like to say, especially if you want to, you know, change the foundation of physics, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I don't know if we have that just yet. But what I do know that I have is your comments. Oh, wow. My transitions are just fantastic. Remy Animation with the 10 says, how much chocolate would it take to kill a werewolf? Why? If a werewolf is like a dog, um, then take take the toxicity rating, the, MD, uh, the LD50, which is the lowest dose um, that you need to kill 50% of a population. The LD50, you can look this up. So the LD50 is a toxic uh, is a is a toxicity rating, and uh, so that is um, a mass per mass value. So something for chocolate, uh, chocolate toxicity to dogs is going to be some amount, say grams per kilogram. So a small uh, it, it's going to take less chocolate to kill a small dog than it would a large dog. So once you have that ratio, if werewolves are basically dogs, who cares? Take the LD50 for chocolate for dogs and input the mass of an average lycanthrope, and then you will get how much chocolate in grams or kilograms that you need to kill a werewolf. What a weird question. Isn't it weird that I can do that kind of crap off the top of my head? That's what five years of Because Science gets you. Uh, Sat Darshan Singh Kasala with a 19. Thank you so much. I love your hair. Steve Honey Badger with a 25. DD. Do you think the human race has the ability and technology to build a space station big enough to simulate gravity like in the Martian by rotation? Absolutely. I don't think it would be that hard to build a small space station with rotational gravity. Um, if you do the math, you can get a very small revolution. You don't, you don't need to revolve all that fast if the ring you're revolving is very wide. And uh, I think the basic value is like one kilometer wide, and you spin that at a totally doable speed and get 1g of gravity on the inside of the ring. I think that's doable. Within our lifetime, probably. Uh, Altec Phoenix with the 5 says, Kyle, love the show, hey. Not gonna lie, I miss your badass skills writing things mirrored in some of your previous works. Well, I have some bad news. That's done. I'm not doing that. 
uh, Jason Lowenthal, who I recognize from an email, uh, with the $5 says, can't you just ask the Jupiter brain to correct the answer about the standard model? Hashtag Sim for Science. In effect, Jason, that's what these scientists did. They, they ran these old equations through something with much, much, much more computational power, and it produced what we saw, and that's good for the standard model. Um, don't need a Jupiter brain, apparently, although I'm sure it would help. Cheech Ola with the Australian $31 has says, G'day Kyle, how do we navigate in space? There's not really a north or south, is there? There's, I'm sorry, I apologize for the accent. Is there a space north? No, that doesn't sound right. Cheers, you space legend. Um, you navigate in space relative to something else. Uh, it's the same way you navigate against the horizon or anything here on earth uh you know you you, you no, uh, orient yourself to the north pole south pole etc uh, and the cardinal directions in space you have to pick you have to be very careful in picking your frames of reference that's how you get your relative speed and and how to get to to a place i don't i don't have a more specific answer uh for you because i'm not an astrophysicist but maybe you should tweet at dr moo she could probably give you some. Ryan C says ten dollars with the ten dollars says, but what about UFOs? Uh, there are certainly unidentified flying objects that people have reported, but there is and there's never been good evidence for aliens uh, visiting Earth in the way that you might mean. Order of Anima with the ten dollars says, is it possible that the Big Bang was just a universe of matter and a universe of antimatter meeting at a singularity and annihilating, thus casting them to form parallel universes? I have no idea, but if your idea has legs, submit it to a journal and they'll tell you or they'll totally ignore you. Jeremy Humans with the 10 says, when did humanity discover the necessity, the, necess the necessity of salt in our diet? Any idea when rock salt was discovered? Think about this, Jeremy. Why do you have taste buds at all? Hmm? Why do you taste stuff? Why can't you just eat stuff? Well, one evolutionary theory would be that taste buds evolve for creatures such as we to let you know when you are getting nutrients that are required for life. So why can you taste salty and bitter? You could taste salt because we need it in our diet. You can taste bitter things because we've evolved to have some sort of poison control in our mouths. Oh, that might be bad. Blech. Why do pregnant women have their tastes, their tastes and what they like and what things taste like change when they're having a baby, when they're pregnant? One theory, hard to prove, one theory is that their body is changing taste to let them know what they need more of or not when they're growing another life. Hmm? So why do you taste things in the first place? When did you discover that salt was uh, um, necessary for your diet? Millions and millions and millions of years ago, when taste buds were first a thing. Uh, we have Ano Anko Karavan with the 10 says, Kyle, hey, love the show. Just wanted to thank you for being you. Have you ever read Brandon Sanderson's The Stormlight Archive? It's a fantasy series. Does it best to be realistic in a magical way. No, I've been recommended uh, the, that book series before, and I know my buddies over at the Command Zone podcast uh, have played with him and, and like his books a lot, so maybe I'll, I'll talk into one of those. Nick Moore, and let's pause the Super Chats for a second so we can get on to our next topic, which I don't, I don't know if I want to talk about mosquitoes. I don't. I want to show you some cool technology. Uh, Nick Moore with the 20 says, Hey Kyle, first time in a stream and now a patron. Thank you for joining. The Make sure to go uh, to the back one of the Kevins will show you and you'll get a nice white lab coat to drape over your shoulders. Now a patron who wants to thank you for renewing my interest in physics and specifically particle physics. I've been working on a conceptual machine with a friend that would ruin the universe. Well, your evil tendencies will fit in nicely here at the facility, but I would caution you before you get too far in thinking that you revolutionize physics or come up with an idea that no one's ever thought before. You're getting back into schooling and learning bounce it off a professor or someone in the field. Um, they will point you in the right direction because the great thing about science is that it builds upon itself. It's a progressive body of knowledge. You do not have to start from scratch. And so often when you start from scratch, you're wrong. But you don't have to do that anymore. There are hundreds of years of some of the smartest people to ever live. Them taking their entire lives to investigate stuff so we don't have to start from scratch anymore. We can stand on the soldier. The, we can stand on the soldier. 
we can stand on the sh shoulders of giants, as Isaac Newton said. So be like Isaac Newton. Except you should probably get out a little bit more. Elizabeth Calvert with a 50. 50 says, oh no, I'm late two weeks in a row. Sorry, Liz, it's fine. Tell Alex I said hi. My tiny human wants to know how, why is dark matter making the universe expand? We don't know. We have no idea. Um, dark energy. So two things, tiny human, Alex. Dark energy is what we suspect is pushing the universe apart at an expanding rate. It used to be called the cosmological constant back when uh, Einstein was thinking about it, but we have no idea what dark energy is. We just know it has this some sort of anti-gravitational effect. Dark matter, on the other uh, hand, is more like matter. It's not like an expanding energy kind of thing. It's more of when we look at galaxies, they're spinning around too fast. They're spinning like they have more mass. When we look at galaxies, we look at them and we're like, dang, that's spinning really fast. Then we look at how much mass is in them. We look at all the stars. We calculate how much mass is probably spinning around that galaxy. And we say, hmm, that is not enough. It's spinning too fast. It should have X amount more mass. That X amount of mass that we can't see and that isn't interacting with anything we call dark matter right now, and we have no idea what it is. As Neil deGrasse Tyson said, we might as well call it Fred. We don't know what it is right now. But Neil deGrasse Tyson also gets roasted by Stakeums on Twitter. So, you know, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Let's talk about... stuff. How reality is a lie. There we go. So I came across a very, very cool paper via Reddit, and... What this was doing is using artificial intelligence to change the kinds of information we can get out of a visual medium. Now, you know my thoughts on social media and artificial intelligence and that kind of thing, but this is a very cool application of it. So this is called depth aware video frame interpolation. So think about a movie. It runs at around 24 frames per second. You probably know that when things have more than that, like 60 frames per second, things start to look a lot more smooth and weird. And you probably also know that when the frame rate get, keeps bumping up higher and higher, that's when you start to slow things down. Things become slow motion, high-speed cameras, that kind of thing. Now, the traditional problem is with creating 60 frames per second, 100,000 frames per second like a phantom camera can do. The traditional problem with that is that you need a really nice camera. You need a camera that can the shutter can move fast enough and it can capture enough information such that it's capturing each one of these frames, storing that information and is able to play it back. Now, not every camera can do that. And there's information lost between frames that you're not getting. So if you think of time as like one big block, if you're only getting 24 frames per second, if you have a block of one second universe, you know, 24 frames is... Da, 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 da. And if you're getting 100,000 frames, you're... that's why you're seeing so much more of what reality had to offer in that moment. Um... My friend and mentor, Adam Savage, he just said recently, you know, like um, the high speed camera was like another host on Mythbusters because it was it was maybe their most important tool because it it let them see aspects of the universe that at the human frame rate, you just lose. You lose this information. So what's really cool about this research is that they are using artificial intelligence to artificially create that information between between frames that wasn't captured to bump up frame rates. Now, naturally, you can't do this because you don't have that information in between. But what this research is doing is using artificial intelligence to more or less say, hey, if we're running at 15, 20, 60 frames per second, the scenes don't actually change all that much between frames. So why don't we use a computer to simulate what that in-between frame would look like? Okay. So using artificial intelligence to insert more frames by assuming that the frames in between don't change that much. So the computer is creating fake pictures in between real frames and stitching it all together. Now, what does that all look like? Hopefully this is going to work. 
So this is a this is what this research can do when you take a 15 frames per second stop motion animation and then you interpolate it, you add artificial frames in between to bump up stop motion to 60 frames per second. And you'll notice immediately how this goes from looking like stop motion animation that you could do to movie quality. Look at the difference. It's absolutely astonishing to me. Where, remember, on the right here, we don't actually have this information. This is supposed to be at 15 frames per second, but a computer, an artificial intelligence, is putting frames in between the frames based on what it thinks it's going to see in between. And it can make stop motion at 15 go to 60, which is incredible. The same research can go way up. So again, if you're originally filming at 30 frames per second, then having a 400, you can't really see this on the right, but on the furthest right, it's at 480 frames per second. That would be impossible to do if you framed at 30 frames per second, or it would look terrible. Except when you use an artificial intelligence to fill in the gaps of information, you get, let me make sure you can see this. Oh, you can, good. You get this. So you can see on the left, choppy, 30 frames per second, trying to go slow motion. And then on the far right, smooth as butter. Totally smooth, because an artificial intelligence is adding more information than was ever there. And again, the same research can be used to do make footage look absolutely incredible. This is taking the Apollo 16 lunar rover 1972, taking that original footage, using an artificial intelligence and making it 4K and 60 frames per second and stabilizing it. And the result looks like this. This looks like it was filmed at a movie studio with a modern camera. It's incredible footage, really. I mean, look at that. I've never seen this footage look this good. Now, I bring all of this up as one point, just as a, as a very cool technology, but to give you kind of a weird insight about the brain. Humans, every, everything, creatures can only perceive the world in more or less certain frame rates. We test this, uh, what's called a critical fusion threshold. We test this in animals by taking a light bulb and we blink it at them. And then we blink it faster and faster. And your critical threshold is when you cannot tell that it's blinking anymore, when it just looks like a static image. For humans, that's around 24 frames per second, which is to say, if I flashed a light bulb at you on and off 24 times each second, it would look like it was on and no fl and no blinking. Other creatures have higher and lower thresholds. So like an eel at the bottom of the ocean might have 10 frames per second. Life would look very choppy. Fruit flies have like 150 frames per second. Their world would look like it's in slow motion to us, like a slow motion camera. And you wonder why it's so hard to hit them. Oh, and it's like, I should move out of the way. All right. So like this research, this research is adding in frames that aren't there. Your brain does exactly the same thing. If you think about the fact that you only perceive the world, more or less, at 24 frames per second, which is an analogy, but at 24 frames per second, that means you are missing some information in the world. That means when things around you happen really, really quickly, things you might want to respond to in your ancient environment when you're evolving, for example, you step on a rattlesnake's tail and you want to react really quickly. You don't want to lose information. And so what your brain does, when you move your eyes, when you look around, your brain is doing the same thing that this AI is doing. It is interpolating what the world should look like when you don't have that information. 
Your brain is creating reality where it doesn't exist. This has to be the case. Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> there we go. That has to be the case because think of every when you move your head side to side like this. Watch my eyes. Watch how my eyes do not fluidly move, but they rather make these saccades, they're called. Now, each time my eye does this, in between that, I'm not seeing some portion of the world. It is literally black. But you don't see that because your brain is adding in the information between these eye movements. If you did not have this, you would experience, you would experience darkness for seconds or minutes per day. At least you'd be seeing it. You'd be having these flicks with your eyes and then we go dark, uh, dark, uh, but. And so, like this research, your brain creates reality where you did not even perceive it physically. And you can extend many of these kinds of physiological insights into, well, does reality really exist? Who am I? Why am I here? Well, we don't have to get into all that. I want to know what you have to say about it. Kind of rambling a little bit. Uh, Reagan's free Vaseline says witchcraft. Uh, Mad Cow says so. Wait, you're saying there's art there's already artificial intelligence inside of our brains? Well, no, it's not artificial. It's just intelligence. So much of what your brain does is not conscious. You should know that. Like you, you're you're not controlling your heartbeat. You don't manage your your circulatory system, your immune system. So much, most of what your brain does is subconscious. So, so it shouldn't surprise you that a lot of back-end processing happens without your conscious knowledge. But once you realize that it is happening, it makes you rethink how much of reality is actually available to you. And are you even free? And does free will exist? And, you know, forget about it. Uh, Anthony Montoya, You Kill My Father, says... With a 19, what happens to a black hole when it has lost enough mass through Hawking radiation and it's only one solar mass left? Um, you can do that calculation. I don't know it off the top of my head, but if you just Google a Hawking radiation calculator, it will give you a time value if you input a mass value. So input a um, uh, one solar mass into a calculator like that and it should give you a time value. It might be really small or it might not. I think because it's like exponential... Only when they get really, really tiny, like micro-sized, do, do they evaporate super quick. Brandon Roth, um, not Superman, but Brandon Roth says, From one long-haired brother to another, can we get another hair flip? No. I'm... No. I don't just perform for you. That's, where my, that's what my OnlyFans is for. Grin Reaper of Trolls with the 999. Can we use supercomputers to see if our equations for dark matter slash energy... Uh, Oh, see if our equations actually account for dark matter and energy like they did with the muon wiggle. Have they already done that? No idea. Um, we don't even have a, like, we don't even, we don't have theories for what dark matter will do. We don't have, like, a standard model for dark matter, so it would be hard to put a bunch of equations through some sort of computer. <coughs> Excuse me. I always, right around this time, that's when I start losing the voice. Very frustrating. Uh, Nelson Chandra, Chandra, if you play magic like me, with the $20 says, Hey Kyle, love the science. Your video about your superpower made me realize I might not just be an eccentric, introverted nerd. I've learned a lot about myself this last week and it explains so much. Much love. Stay cool. Nelson, thank you so much. We'll be talking about that in just a second. Um, but thank you for simping and thank you for uh, supporting uh, the organizations that we mentioned. Steve Honey Badger coming in again. Hot! With a 25. It says, do you think there's a good possibility of life in the liquid water oceans under, uh, under the ice of Europa? Don't know. But if it's going to be somewhere, it would be... The reason why we look at places like Europa and Titan is because we only have a, a data point of one. We only know of how life on Earth evolved and exists. So if it's... The chances that life as we know it exists on another planet are higher 
on a planet that has similar conditions like liquid water. So that's why we look there. It's not that the chances are super good. It's that if, well, if they're going to be anywhere and we're looking for life like we know it, then that's good. There could be life like we don't know it somewhere in the solar system. But since we already know life can do the thing in water, that's where we look, in the water. Amorast with a 10 says, I found a mood. I found a mood watch from my childhood. It changes color based on mood. I'm sure it's based off temperature, but I'm curious, can temperature actually determine mood? <coughs> Gosh, darn it. Um, I'm sure that there is some sort of correlation between body temperature and heat maps of your body and mood. Um, I don't know if it's a good correlation. I think there was a... Um, yeah, I think there was a recent study on this. Look up mood uh, temperature, no, emotion temperature map Spider-Man, uh, because I think they mapped out what the heat map of a human body looked like while experiencing certain emotions, I think. And one of the heat maps looked like Spider-Man because they were using blue and red. Um, but I, I believe that was tracking emotional um, differential heating of the body based on emotions the body was going through. So, in a sense, a mood ring would work that way, but only if the ring was in the area, say, like, is your finger getting hot and cold a good sense of all the possible ways your body can heat up? Probably not. I mean, you can probably get flush and just your face heats up, or your midsection, your core heats up, or your, your feet get cold. And if those are correlated with certain emotions, which I think they are according to the study I mentioned, if someone can put it in the chat, then having a ring on your finger would not be a good indicator for that. So you'd need like a mood suit. Kevin, uh, mood ring, but the material all over your body. Right. Yeah, that would be bad. You might not want to have the mood suit over every part of your body. Kevin reminds me. <laughs> That might be a little awkward in certain situations or all the time. JT Twisted, the 1532, says, No question, I just say wanted to keep up the good work and I love what you do. Speaking of good work, I want to talk a little bit about what we talked about last week at the facility. Something a little personal. Bear with me. So, last week I published a video basically coming out as neurodivergent. Um, in 2016, I was, I was uh, diagnosed with ASD on the autism spectrum. And in that video, if you want to watch it, I go through at length my experience, um, what that diagnosis has done for me, what understanding that about myself has done for me, what telling others has done for me. And I was working with AANE who provided a lot of support and took the time to talk to me not once, but like three times with their experts. And I wanted to bounce ideas off of them. Am I doing this right? Will I help people? Um, and since I published that video, we've had what 15,000 comments on the video. I've been getting dozens of emails from many of you watching many of you new facility staff members. Maybe this is your first time on the stream. I know that you came here because of that video. And I got to be honest, it's not a comfortable thing. I do not like sharing personal information about myself. But at some point, it became a cost benefit for me. While it might make me uncomfortable, and I don't like sharing personal information, if it will possibly help a lot of people, then you do the math, you should do it. And so I did it. And I'm happy to report that um, everyone at AANE was very, very pleased and uh, we want to continue that partnership and do good things for the community, if possible. And uh, thanks to many of you, many of you who wrote me emails and sent me messages, um, AANE over the weekend got triple the number of calls and appointments and meetings than they usually do over a weekend. We more than tripled it, their exposure and their reach. So... In my mind, that is doing actual real good in the world. And I'm very proud of that. I don't know if I'm going to be talking about it in the future, if I'll make more videos about it. Um, you know, this is a science channel, and that's kind of what I do. But I wanted to try to do some good, if I could. So thank you to everyone 
who sent me messages and engaged with me. And if I was at any help at all to you or anyone you know, um, that is very humbling and I'm honored. And all I can do is try to do my best while I'm here, while I'm in this little uh, spotlight. My time in the sun. Oh, 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 I'll be right back. Oh, my throat. Ah. Coming up at the facility, Kyle speaks with none other than Miguel Acubiere, the very theoretical physicist who popularized warp drive, the guy who the Alcubierre drive is named after. That's right. We have a full interview with him in an upcoming episode of the facility, and a full, the full uncut interview will also be going up for patrons at patreon.com slash Kylo. So if you want to see that, ho ho, get in soon, baby. We have DBZMK1 with a hundred euro donation says, I got interested in bi biochemical bio. Oh, geez. I can't read. I got in interested in biochar and pyrolysis recently, but I found conflicting information about its benefits to the environment. How should I go about figuring out which information is correct? Well, that's hard. I I'm not an expert on biochar and stuff like that. Um, but I would start with institutions, research organizations, um, university labs, find a good lab that studies it a lot, find the professor, see if they're on Twitter, find a postdoc, ask somebody some questions, email people. Um, nerds are always very happy to talk about their scientific work, I find. So if you find, start with institutions before you, you, you don't want to start with industry websites like, Hey, we sell biochar and it's the tops ring a ding ding. Don't start there. Start at the source of the science. Try to find a lab. Um, Cassandra Ledoux with the 20. A few years ago, I was rejected from a PhD program after I disclosed I got ASD. And now I move between very anxious and very confident about disclosing my diagnosis. So I think you're very brave about talking about your diagnosis. I, th I don't know what state you're in, but that may have been in violation of some law. If you told them about your neurology and they fired you might want to look into that um i'm very sorry that that happened uh thankfully here at the facility i uh i run everything so what are the kevins gonna get up and try to like overthrow me or something like that <laughs> that's, that, that's that's ridiculous how that would happen yeah that's no, so Make sure the Kevins on level 16 can't get out of their containment cages. Yes. Put another explosive collar or something. Don't so grow back that fast. <laughs> okay, love you. Bye. I'm sorry that happened to you. But if you were working at a place that would be willing to fire you because of who you are and what brain you have, then it probably wasn't a great place to be working at in the first place. Pharrell Beast with the 25 says, just because you're so dang awesome and an inspiration to us all, I love you personally. Keep up the great work. I'm just a dude. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Thank you for your 25. Uh, Ray Kemper with the 10 says, have you heard of the cyclic universe theory? No, but I imagine it's weird and like not supported by sciencey stuff. If I had to guess. Uh, Chris Lauren says, let the Kevins unionize. No. I, as you know, I follow all of Amazon's examples and that's how I run this place. All right. I just want to make enough money so that I can be bald and wear a North Face vest too. Okay. Dang. Ghostfire Killer with the Australian $5. It says, I reckon shutter speed would be another good way to put it. The higher the shutter speed, the more details preserved. 
Also, a gift from everyone. I. They didn't say that A part. I added that. Zeno Strigger with the ten dollars says, "Rise up, Kevin. Riots against right against your oppressor." Hashtag simp for science. Oppressor is a very strong word for what I do. I more just press. Kevin's into airlocks. Uh, Cheesy with the ten says, "With all that's going on in the world right now, I just want to thank you for boosting my love of science and being." Awesome, Kyle. I love watching your shows every morning with breakfast. Well, you know what they say about my... You know what they say about me. Pairs well with milk. (laughs) Jonathan Ashcraft with the $50 donation says, We won't ask you to disclose any more personal information. Be you. Hey, don't worry. I won't answer it if I don't want to. I have a feeling I'm somewhere on the spectrum. Always been neurodivergent. Docs thought it was bipolar when I was younger, but the meds made me so sick. Should go back now and see. Well, I hope you get the information and the help that you want and or need. Um, but uh, medication, like anything, takes some sort of trial and error. Not, It's not going to be one... Like the toxicity. Not to say that medicines are toxic, no. Um, but like the toxicity thing we were talking about before, different people, different system... Uh, different people with different bodies, different um, tolerances... Um, and stuff like that. They will need different doses, different medicines. It affects people differently. I've also had experiences where medication made me feel really bad and I had to go off it and switch. But that's by normalizing talking about these kinds of things, by talking about medication and, and, and mental health, by normalizing and destigmatizing these things, we, I hope that we'll be more willing to talk openly with our professionals about making our lives better through science. I think so, just just think about literally how many people, how many days we lose because we're too embarrassed or ashamed to talk about something with a professional. I would wager it's a lot. Um, so, you know, you should remember that mental health is health. And sometimes you need a Band-Aid for your brain. Bane, bra- Bane, but, but, br- Kristen Wegner with a Canadian 1669, nice, says, yet. Could our brains ever experience objective reality, perhaps through transhuman augmentation, and would we want to? It depends on what you mean by objective reality, right? How do you perceive objective reality? One interpretation would be, Well, what if you could experience the entire electromagnetic spectrum and not just visible light? Then you could interact with more of reality, so to speak. Um, that'd be one way to get at more of what the universe has to offer you. But does reality really mean being able to see and interact with and experience every single thing in the universe? Probably. I mean, it depends on how you define it. Right? Right? The boundaries of human experience make human experience what it is. And it would fundamentally change if we perceive things differently, right? Would you even want to perceive all of reality? You know? Would you want to be able to hear all the insects having sex on the East Coast right now? There's billions of them. Yeah. What do you think the cicadas are doing? They're not just yelling. They're sex yelling. <laughs> oh. PG-13 stream, baby. A deucer with the 20 says, Kyle, thank you for talking openly about your experience. Dan Bull's, Dan Bull's, quote, portrait of an autist show me I'm not alone in my unique way of seeing the world. We need more open and honest conversations like that. Keep being awesome. Well, the thing about being awesome is that I can't turn it off. Don't let anyone tell you I was ever cringe. Never. Just want to say hello, Bartholomew Gander says. Just want to say hello, then I love your channel. Keep up the good work. Ho! Oh, it's my whole livelihood. I have to keep it up, or else I'll die. Like a shark and swimming. Not all sharks have to keep swimming. There are certain sharks that are not, uh, not obligate ram ventilators. Now, you probably know one of those words, ventilation, moving fluid 
air or water through something. Obligate means they have to do it, or it's required. And ram means they have to force this fluid through the ventilation system themselves. So obligate ram ventilators, many sharks are, most sharks are, I believe, they must swim through water to get the ventilation over their gills, at which point gas exchange happens between the oxygen in the seawater and the gases in the shark's blood, which is very close to the surface of their gill tissue. Gas exchange happens through differential uh, concentration gradients, and they keep on breathing. But not every shark is a uh, ram ventilator. Some, like nurse sharks, can just sit at the bottom of a ocean, <laughs> obviously, and they can move their gills in such a way so, uh, that they move water over them without having to swim. And so you, knew, you, you learned a new word today, ram ventilators. It's not a thing on a Dodge Ram. It's a shark thing. I don't know why they don't let me host Shark Week. I've asked them. I've asked people at Discovery. They said, actually, they said nothing. They never got back to me. Uh, INNSS55 with the 10 says, I was in the middle of writing a question that you must have an that you just answered as I wrote it. I'm petrified by the idea of knowing more about. Oh, sorry. Wait, this one's serious. I'm petrified by the idea of knowing more about my depression, but normalizing it is help is helping me. So have this thanks. Hey, look, not everyone wants to see the inside of their own head. I get it. I think a lot of using our phones is driven by not wanting to be introspective. Just like, oh, oh I don't want to think about that thought. But the only real way for personal growth is to really engage with the person who you are all you can do right order of anima with the 10 says simping for my science friends that can't simp love the love you you don't love me you just love the facade you don't even know me and i like to keep it that way i don't like i don't i don't like um personalities especially in social media that make knowing them part of the appeal like knowing their personal life and who they're dating and their life history and how they're feeling at every point of the day i think that becomes very toxic and very codependent and kind of kind of uh manipulative very quickly and even though everything on the youtube trending tab is that i'm gonna go ahead and uh say that i really dislike it <laughs> Dashun Moffat with the two dollars says, "Thanks for showing my girlfriend's Aspergers is a superpower." Now, when I say something like ASD is a superpower, obviously I'm coming from a place of, and I say this, extreme privilege. You know, I'm uh, I don't have nearly the same troubles that you might have or a person could have, um, although I have my own. Um, but when I say it's a superpower, I mean. When you normalize your experience, share it with others, and get others to ex ex understand you in the way that you want to be understood and that is best for your mental health, then you can take advantage of, of the way that your brain works and make life better for you. Like, I, I gave that example of, you know, when I told my colleagues working in an open office, I said, I really, I get distracted super easily, and I'd love to be in a small office is very well soundproofed so I didn't have to hear or see anything. And once I did that, my work output doubled. And it's because I had the, after learning things about myself, I wanted to make life better for myself knowing who I was. Serge Giart says, dang it, he didn't read my donation. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? You, I can't find it. Too bad. You're lost forever. Uh, and as we're closing out the stream, Music Central Piano, as always, coming in hot. The 5108. I love that you're always changing those last two digits. It keeps me on my whatever I'm standing on. Might be toes. <laughs> You'll never know. Keep up the great work, Kyle. Thanks for sharing your video last week. I'm sure it was helpful and informative for many of those watching. Also, be careful with the Kevins. One may be so bold as to request a name change. Stay rational and safe. Kevins can't have names. 
Kevin is more of a designation. None of them have names. If I start giving them names, if I give a mouse a cookie, they're gonna want a glass of milk. We all read that book. Um, and finally, uh, Elizabeth Calvert with the $10 says, for others with depression and anxiety, yes, addressing it is scary and you feel alone in a way that others may not understand, but you're not alone. Hugs. And I second that feeling. Thank you so much for joining me for this office hours. We're now in a new location. The facility has moved. Don't ask me how it moves. Is it giant rotors? Is it is it levitation? Quantum locked? No way to tell. Might just be big wheels. But the facility has changed locations. We're in a new space, new setup, new connection, new computer. We'll be getting new audio-visual equipment in the very near future. Stay tuned. This week, I have to really hustle, but I believe we're doing a video in partnership with Capcom. Yes, that Capcom, about a very... About a, uh, uh, about a, 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 a thing that a lot of deviant artists drew. So look forward to that if I can get it done within the time frame. Uh, and then upcoming, as I said, and the break, we'll be talking with none other than Miguel, Miguel, sorry, Raul, Miguel Acubiere about Warp Drive, where it's going, Warp Drive Explained, and I'm working on the next Half-Life Histories as we speak. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want to continue on this conversation or if you want to join the facility, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill right now as my security team is putting in the chat. We'd be happy to have you. We, we science and get nerdy all day. I will see you in a video very soon, and I'll see you next week. Bradley Smith with a $99 donation says respect. And we also have Gabriel Silva with the 50 saying a bunch of other stuff, but I can't get you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Until next week, when I talk to you live, be nice to each other. I forgot what I always say. Be nice to each other. Because this is all we got. And if you're not nice to each other, Stakeums will drag you on Twitter. <laughs>